Okay, welcome everybody to the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. This is the third in the series and I'd like to thank everybody for the support that we've shown for the first two and, and for, for, for this current one. I think we've got two um, very different but uh, you know very exciting companies joining us here today. So I'm just going to do a quick little intro before we head hand over to Mr. Eddie Geller, our first presenter for today. So the structure of the webinars, we'll have two companies presenting, that's 30 minutes each. We'll have 20 minutes of a prezzo, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. If you can type your questions into the Q&A box, and then I will um, put the questions to the presenters um, at the end of their respective um, presentations. Just to note that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, in due course, probably uh, over the weekend sometime. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, you can get us on Twitter at C Microcaps. Obviously, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel for this webinar and all future webinars, plus our two past webinars. Um, we also have a LinkedIn page for longer form content. Our first presentation is from Tiny Beans Group uh, with Mr. Eddie Geller, the CEO, and the second presentation is going to be Appium Animal Health um, with Dr. Chris Richards. I'd especially like to thank um, Eddie Geller for joining us uh, live from New York. It's a uh, very end of the day on his side, so I especially want to say thanks, Eddie, for taking the time out of his day to uh, present to us here this morning. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand you over to Eddie. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Hopefully everyone can um, hear me um, and see the presentation in front of them. Um, so uh, I'm super excited to be able to talk to everyone today and share more about Tiny Beans with everyone. Um, some of you may be new to the story, so I'll try to give you a bit of an overview. Some of you are familiar with the story, um, looking to present some of the latest um, information and where we're at as a company. So th thanks so much for your time today. Um, and obviously excited to be able to share an update of where things are at for the company. Um, so uh, for those of you that um, don't know Tiny Beans, um, we've been um, operating for a number of years since 2012. I'm based in New York, like Mark said, um, and most of the team here is now. I moved over here just on five years ago. And Tiny Beans um, is a platform that are really allows you know, new parents to be able to not only capture their children's lives and allow them to be able to share them with family all over the world, but also be able to access content um, and valuable resources um, through the journey of parenting. So uh, Tiny Beans, as I said, is a, it's a platform for parents and families. And then more recently, we acquired a company called Red Tricycle a few months ago. And Red Tricycle is this wonderful platform for parents, especially around the relation to their content and obviously their, their kids. So what's great about you bringing the two worlds together of what Red Tricycle does and what Tiny Beans does is about, you know, Red Tricycle is about the inspiration of what to do um, and where to do it with your kids. And Tiny Beans is really the platform that allowed to capture and share that in a private setting um, with uh, the people that matter all over the world. So at you know, present, we're integrating the two, um, you know, uh, experiences the two uh, platforms, the two teams, and I'll talk about that through the, um, through the presentation today because that's probably the most relevant um, information in recent times. In terms of our bigger vision though, um, you know, um, the overall goal is to, is to build out a much more significant platform when it comes to parents and their children. We see a world where we can create this highly personalized experience that's tailored based on the various stages of where the kids are at, and also for you as the parent and for you know, um, a grandparent, et cetera. So we see a world where we can present to you on a Friday, here are great things to do this weekend with your two-year-old. We see a world where on a Saturday comes along and says, here are, some, here are some restaurants to go to, or some babysitters to book, or a birthday comes along next week. So really we're building out a platform around recommendation, a platform around you know, highly relevant things based on all the aspects of what we know about you, which may be little at the start, but over time, as you get to use the platform more and more, and as you get to experience it and tell us more about you, we can then use that data to then um, you know, tailor and provide you um, more relevant information. 
So whether it's a recommendation around sleeping, a recommendation for a birthday present, recommendation of what to do. It's really about bringing those, all these together and content being so significant as part of this overall vision was the main reason and the main um, justification for us in, uh, acquiring the Retricycle business. So, and again, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but this is a vision we're building out um, in the future years to be able to offer these wonderfully tailored experiences for um, parents and their families. In terms of our journey so far, so for those of you that don't know much about the company, we started in 2012 in Sydney. Uh, I moved over 2015 to set up operations in the US. And then through the journey, it was, it's really a, um, a combination of building out the team, hitting milestones around registered users, milestones around revenue, milestones around engagement. Um, you know, we were successfully selected as Apple's app of the day in the US now twice, 2019 and 2020 recently, which is pretty um, incredible um, a milestone. There's, I think now, three million apps in the App Store to be selected as one of only a handful every year is pretty incredible. It just shows you the quality and the focus we put around the experience. And then more recently, um, we acquired Retricycle and the last couple of years, we've had some great partnerships with Lego, which I actually want to talk about in more detail later on here. So it's been a wonderful journey, but it's really in, 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 um, in many respects, um, um, only the beginning. There's lots of things we want to be doing to building up um, the company and where we're at today. As far as the highlights go, um, over the last three months, this is, I guess, to the end of March quarter. This is also in market, um, so I'm not gonna go through each of these line by line, but these are some of the highlights over the last um, period of time, everything from we've had growth in um, revenue, we've had growth in users, we've clearly acquired the company and some advertising wins, and I'm gonna talk about some of these um, in detail through the presentation. Um, but the other thing to note is that, you know, um, we've uh, you know we've been a little bit impacted by COVID-19 um, but largely we, we believe it's an opportunity for us that we'll um, see significant growth in subsequent quarters um, so uh, it's definitely been an impact but as advertisers which is one of our main revenue streams are seeing value in trusted platforms that connect to families we're often more recently seen as a great um, option for them so we're definitely having wonderful conversations with um, you know, uh, new brands, existing brands in the toy category, in e-learning, in basically um, in, uh, you know, in personal services. So a whole range of opportunities are coming about as a consequence of this. Definitely there's been impacts around brands that we have worked with that have delayed things, um, and that's natural because of what's going on, but we definitely see it as an opportunity, and I'll unpack that in more detail as we go. In terms of revenue, um, we've had... Um, great you know revenue growth um largely and i'll talk about these a little bit later it's been largely advertising is really the um the revenue of the company and um, for those of you that aren't aware it's advertising um is around 80 percent of our revenue stream we then have um a premium subscription model so it's a free product that people can download and use and then they can upgrade to a paid premium version of the app um, and there's a premium experience which is a monthly and annual subscription also a uh, lifetime if they choose to and then we also have a small printing business where you get to print photo books, et cetera. That makes up the revenues. Again, there's a lot more information out there around the revenues, but that's sort of the highlight of, our, of where we're at. And we'll definitely see that grow subsequent quarters. The red tricycle revenue is only in um, a month of the last quarter. You'll see that grow um, more into this quarter and beyond. As far as, you know, the main, you know, um, the ways in which we look at the business and the main, I guess, elements, I guess, the registered members, it all starts with our users, members, parents, grandparents, etc. So that's grown, you know, month on, quarter on quarter extensively. We've had, you know, really acceleration in the last 30 days of the back of COVID-19. And this is something that actually um, probably most of you do not know. If you are familiar with the space, um, there's a company called Lifecake, which is one of our competitors out of the UK. But last week, um, they announced that they're actually shutting down. So um, their business has not been able to build a commercial enterprise. Um, they had um, slightly less users than us, I think between two and three million, um, and they're shutting down. And we've definitely seen growth actually in recent days and recent weeks um, uh, for users coming across from the Lifecake platform over to Tiny Bean. So we'll definitely see that growth this quarter, um, you, know, you know, as that, you know, a, a platform shuts down. So that's, um, that's great. In terms of um, the premium subscription, that continues to grow. 
we, it hasn't been a product of investment in the last 12 months, although that will change later this year. We definitely see um, that opportunity, but that continues to grow. Revenue continues to grow really solidly. Um, and that's great you know, forward book and recurring revenue that drives retention. As far as retention goes, you can see um, that's continued to grow. So we track 12 month retention on based on different cohorts. So the way this works is that the people that signed up 12 months ago, how many of them are still active and using the platform uh, today? So this is the way um, you know, it's been mapped. You can see um, improvement on recent years based on the 12 month retention. You can see it's incredibly high, you know, 85 to 90%, I think it's about 88% retention on premium subscription over 12 months. So incredibly high engagement. In terms of active users, um, and we define an active user who have engaged and interacted on the platform in the last month, so it's really grown um, over the over the, over the last year. It's grown on the Tiny Beans platform, and now it's been um, uh, and now the Retricycle your website has been added to it. So this is the combined active users. When I say active, that's really on the two platforms. There's a much larger social following um, in the deck we shared earlier on in January around the acquisition of of Retricycle. They have a, a, a social audience following of between I think 11 to 13 million. Um, if you add up all the different channels, I think we reach about 20 to 25 million people a month across our platforms and social. So you know, uh, uh, the reach has grown extensively. Net promoter score um, is a really important measure for us. Net promoter score, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, is, a, is measured based on people that are, I guess, fond of your brand and, you know, um, and they're called promoters. Typically a question you may have seen in the past is out of 10, how likely are you to recommend this product? Um, to a friend or colleague um, that, that's a promoter if it's at the um, uh, eight, nine or 10. And if you do zero to six, it's a detractor and then they, and then they take out the ones in the middle. So um, world class is considered 70 plus. Um, and you can see in, in recent years, we've really um, delivered on that. And actually it's grown again this year. So we work really hard to make sure our members, our audience is really looked after. Um, and, uh, and you can see that, you know, um, delivered there. So, I mean, we're hoping that that'll retain and stay above 70 is really our goal. And then the other thing that's really been positive, our average deal sizes has, has gone up. And we see that'll continue as our audience has grown, brands that are attracted to us um, is growing, and so will the, audience, the, the deal sizes. You can see the deal sizes grow in recent years and this year as well. And this is just to, uh, to now, obviously that the financial year is not finished and it's in US dollars. So exciting to see more deals, larger deals. As far as the Red Tricycle acquisition, it's really been phenomenal um, so far, although it's been early. So we've had great growth uh, on both platforms, you know, more, um, more users we've attracted, those users have come and delivered and engaged on content and filling their needs, whether it's sharing, consuming, reflecting, and because of that, it's driving more and more engagement, whether that's through the app, whether it's, more, it's through opening emails, more engagement through emails, more engagement through adding comments, etc. It's really been phenomenal in terms of seeing not only growth of our core platform of Tiny Beans, but also adding the retricycle dimension to it. So we're definitely every day working on bringing the two worlds together, even so that even today, if you go into the Tiny Beans app and in the feed, you're starting to see retricycle content. So um, that's been integrated and our, our, our Tiny Beans audience is already um, consuming retricycle content and integrating those two. And that's just the beginning. There's so much more we want to do there. As far as market validation, those of you that sort of haven't seen much of the company, um, here are a couple of sort of, um, I guess, uh, articles that were posted last year, whether it's New York Times, we've been in Washington Post, we've been in Forbes. And again, as privacy is becoming more and more relevant, um, platforms like Tiny Beans are becoming, you know, um, more an important part of everyday lives. So it's definitely something that, that um, you'll see as something to, to stay and growing rather than something that, that um, it'll stay niche and not grow, but we definitely see this as a, as a, um, as a trend um, in future years. Um, so, so, so I thought it'd be worthwhile also sharing a bit about some of the um, case studies. I guess, you know, Lego was a partnership we signed last year. This is the case study of the success of last year. Um, so I'm not gonna go through it in detail. You can obviously go through it in your own time. I'm happy to answer questions, but the wonderful thing about Lego is they wanted to grow the, the I guess, the penetration of Duplo for parents and families with kids, preschoolers, so roughly five, um, down to 18 months old. So very targeted. And they wanted to, to try and drive Duplo in terms of becoming an evergreen product rather than being a gifted product once a year. They wanted to grow the, the trust around parents to be, well, you can buy Lego all year round. 
So last year was the first um, the first time we partnered with them. It was really successful, and they've upped the partnership this year. We announced a few months ago. Um, you know, that's actually kicked off this month in 2020. So that's a great example of a brand working with us, our, our audience loving it, and then you know they're growing the the investment into 2020. Um, so whether it's milestones, whether it's birthdays, whether it's a whole range of just general content to help parents, this is where you know um, some of the partnerships and some of the brands sort of get integrated. Walt Disney Studios is a is one of the clients of Red Tricycle. This is a great example of how you know wonderful content gets consumed through the Red Tricycle platform. Um, you know, actually, Studios is a, is a is a is a wonderful um, a segment for us. So whether it's the launch of movies, you know, the launch of obviously um, new releases, um, it's often done with with Red Tricycle and the movie studio. So Lion King was a great one last year, um, and 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 there's a whole bunch of others planned for this year as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, just another example of how you can use wonderful content that's already being pushed out there and bring that into Red Tricycle in a really beautiful way that then gets served up to you know the audience um, similarly. So whether it's on the Red Tricycle website or whether it's basically on social, you can see the results of how many views were were um, delivered across the social video um, outside the platform, um, and again that drives engagement and relevance for the brand that then will obviously drive more and more investment on a platform like this. So. That's just one of the examples. But, but there's many more. Um, they're just two that I thought would be worthwhile sharing. There's many brands that we work with, whether it's smaller, whether it's large. And, and this, um, this roster is definitely growing. We're excited to uh, have more and more new partners this year and grow existing partners, of course. Um, so, so as far as the goals for this year and, and so execution priorities, I thought it would be worthwhile sharing. So clearly, you know, um, completing the acquisition of Red Tricycle was a key one. So for those of you that are familiar, it was entirely a U.S. business, um, the whole team in the U.S. So we've completed the acquisition as at the end of February was officially when it came through. We've been since then integrating the sales teams and now we have a unified sales proposition. So when we talk to brands, it's a single pitch. It's a single value prop. And we talk about obviously the value across both platforms, whether it's you know scale on retrievable, whether it's the hyper targeting of tiny beans is bringing those two worlds together, and that's just the starting point. Um, in terms of our uh, um, scale, we've got, we've had some, uh, some really positive engagement in recent months. I shared in the in the um, Q3 release um, a little under a month ago that we had you know we hit over a million weekly active. There's, there's some work behind the scenes to enable that and make sure that uh, our members are still getting phenomenal experience and service. So that's something that's really been there in recent times. Um, and then you said the things that have done, but there's still lots of things we have to do. We have to integrate the rest of the teams, whether it's consumer marketing, whether it's product engineering, there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing there. We're transitioning product engineering to the US, so we announced that in January. So we had a product team, an engineering team in Sydney that's been transitioned to the US and we're extending that team here. So that's still being done. Um, that's still work in progress, and we're hoping to do that. You know, obviously, uh, this year. Well, not hoping. We absolutely will do that this year. Um, hopefully, sooner rather than later. And then um, we want to integrate a, a streamlined experience, right? So when you go to a tricycle, when you go to Tiny Beans, it's completely streamlined between the two. So we want to obviously bring those two together this year. So in terms of why Tiny Beans, so we're 100% you know brand safe. We're trusted across your know, incredible audience, which is why the NPS is so high. Fixed costs, you know, margins are very high in a business like this. We've got, you know, um, uh, financially, you know, um, uh, very comfortable. We've got um, at the end of March, 5.8 million Aussie cash and bank. Um, and although we're still burning cash, um, the, the, you know, that's declining. And we definitely see the cash in the bank being very comfortable at this stage. Huge market, of course, you know, parents and families are everywhere. And that's not going to stop. And we're very much in commercialization mode. We're very much around increasing the revenues, increasing um, the different ways in which you know um, we'll be able to grow these these revenues. So with that, I'm going to um, pause. Um, hopefully, that hasn't gone you know too long over time. And happy to answer uh, questions. Um, thank you very much, Eddie. We've got uh, two questions straight off the bat. Um, the first one, I think, uh, I think is a good one. Is how much is a premium subscription? You know, between the free users and then if you upgrade, how much are the premium users paying? Sure, absolutely. So it's so a premium subscription. Um, we have a monthly subscription of $8 US a month. We have an annual subscription of $50 US a year. And then we have a lifetime of $250. Um, and typically, I would say, you know, a small portion do monthly. 
I would say about 50% do um, annual, and we have a really high portion of, of lifetime, about 40, 42% end up buying lifetime. So they typically think that, and the lifetime is $250 US, they typically think that if you're gonna have multiple kids, having this one incredible space that's highly trusted and have all the kids' memories forever, um, high resolution, et cetera, in one place, that's not a lot to pay for. So, uh, so that's really the way the premium, um, the premium subscription works. Okay, and then another one, I think this is actually kind of a question I was going to ask is um, how does the company think about customer retention as children move out of the zero to four age group? I've seen you in another interview, Eddie. I think maybe just sketch out the difference between the Tiny Beans offering in terms of age groups and the Red Tricycle acquisition in terms of age groups. Perfect, great question. I probably should have uh, I'm highlighted that. So, so thanks for the question. Yes, yeah, so, so typically, Tiny beans audiences and brand new parents that typically have, you know, um, they've just had the baby. Um, the highest engagement is zero to six typically, although um, it also depends on the age of the youngest child. If you have two or three kids, if you've got like an 11, 12 year old, you've also got a three year old, you're still engaging on the Tiny Beans platform. So, so um, but largely the highest engagement is zero to six. Um, if you look at Red Tricycle, their highest engagement is all the way through to 12 years old. And actually it's probably, you know, preschool so four five all the way to 12 that's one of the main reasons why um you know acquiring them and and uh, bolting them onto the tiny beans experience was really valuable because now we offer we're looking to offer you know parents uh, with the kids all ages to be able to have the whole experience so you can you start with tiny beans you're highly engaged and as the kids grow up you can still engage in the platform via valuable content you might be posting photos every day when the kids eight but you still want to access valuable content with us, what to do this weekend, to where to go next holidays, to basically, you know, how to think about gifting or Halloween. There's a, there's a whole range of valuable content and that's largely for the older audience. So we can now say we, we, we have an audience and we cater for all their kids need zero through to 12 years old. Okay, and then another one, um, what's the estimated break even annual recurring revenue and on the current run rate, when would you expect to break even? Yeah, great question. Um, I think um, the um, with the integration of Red Tricycle, um, and uh, I think if if we didn't have the slowdown in recent months, I think it would have been um, far sooner in terms of revenue growth, you know, um, costs being um, uh, fixed, and us getting to cash flow positive. I guess the difficulty with figuring out when that will be is is basically figuring out you know, how quickly. Um, the markets will recover, how quickly advertisers will, you know, really look to double down in the space and then our, our revenues to be able to climb accordingly. So, so we're definitely still very focused on getting to sustainability and getting to um, a place where, you know, obviously our revenues are you know, far ahead of our costs. Hard to tell when that will be. Um, clearly, ideally sooner rather than later. Um, as I said before, um, I think that, uh, you know, the revenue will continue to grow. Um, and uh, we're in a great position with the current time to really maximize that. But we're still doing a lot of work around integration. There's a lot of internal work to figure out processes to be a consolidation of, of value and obviously cross training, right? Um, the Retricycle had a really successful sales team. We're cross, they, I'm cross training them on the Tiny Beans platform. So it's going to take us a little while to get that right. So um, hard to say when, but it's definitely, um, just so you know, it's definitely a, a focus of ours. We definitely intend to. Um, do it you know, as soon as possible, but not at the expense of missing out on bigger opportunities. We obviously want to grow the platform and continue to grow the audience and engagement, but we definitely want to get to a, uh, a place where we're um, clearly sustainable on our own merit, but hard to say when that'll be exactly. Okay, and then another question, Eddie. Um, the terms of split of users between the US and the rest of the world, I mean, obviously started in Australia, but how does that split of users look now? Yeah, um, uh, great question. Thank you. Um, so most of the audience is US. So Red Tricycle, um, I would say 90% plus the US. Um, on the Tiny Bean side, we're about 75, 80% US. So, so collectively, it's probably about 85%. And we still have a decent audience in Australia. Um, uh, you know, a good you know quarter of a million people in Australia are still using the platform quite well. And then we have a small audience in the UK and in Canada, and then the rest pretty much scattered. So US is still the largest market um, and you know our whole team and all our focus is here. Having said that, we do get opportunities that come about from 
other parts of the world who want to grow into the US. So that's been an interesting um, opportunity. And then occasionally we'll get um, interest from Australia because we still have a very loyal um, audience there, albeit the fact it's far smaller. But the largest business, um, the largest part of the audience is in the US. Okay, I think we've covered off all of the questions, Eddie. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I know it's late there on your side in New York. And uh, yeah, we'll follow the, the story with interest. Thank you. Sure, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Mark. And if anyone has any further questions or anything else I'd like to uh, follow up on, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks, Eddie. And now I'd like to hand over to our second presenter, um, Dr. Chris Richards. And yeah, we couldn't be moving from two more different spots from uh, New York out to uh, Bendigo out in rural Victoria. Chris, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. And um, thanks for the opportunity to speak at the uh, Coffee Microcaps uh, seminar series this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Richards and I'm uh, Managing Director of, um, of APM Animal Health. I, th I, can't, I, think, I think that's all working. So um, I'll just start off, give a bit of an overview of, uh, of APM. So APM is a, um, it's a veterinary group that, um, that was founded in 1998 uh, by myself. And then we listed in December 2015 to fund the acquisition of um, some of Australia's largest veterinary groups. We acquired 12 large veterinary groups uh, on the one day, five of which we already had uh, equity positions. Um, We've got a very diversified and robust business model, and it certainly has a rural and, and regional focus. Uh, we're vertically integrated across the uh, entire value, um, value chain for animal health. And what I mean from that is we, we not only provide veterinary services, we supply in products, we procure products um, direct from manufacturers globally, um, and then we um, deliver those products uh, directly into um, the majority of our client base. Uh, we also provide other ancillary services to support our veterinary services uh, in the areas of uh, genetic services and nutrition and, um, and through consulting services around biosecurity and, and food safety. Uh, we service a whole spectrum of both the production animals, the pigs, uh, pig industry, dairy, beef feedlot, uh, sheep industry, as well as uh, the companion animals that uh, we have in our clinics in the large uh, regional cities. We, uh, we've also uh, um, have a number of uh, complementary and high growth opportunities, um, which we've been developing over the last few years that we've started to bring to market over the, the last six months. Uh, we're currently executing on, a, on a, the final stage of a three year plan. The initial part was around building um, processing capacity and integrating those initial 12 clinics. Um, our second part is around growing our animal numbers and then leveraging these new products and services across our large uh, animal footprint. There's a very strong uh, long-term industry outlook for regional uh, production animals with the supply of meat uh, in Australia and also uh, through export markets. And we're also seeing growth in the companion animal sector in, uh, in rural and regional Australia. Uh, APM's got an attractive financial profile. Um, I'll show you in a minute. We've got revenue growth year on year. We're uh, expanding our gross margin um, continually and we've got strong operating uh, cash flows. Uh, in terms of uh, our position in the ASX, we are just over a $50 million market cap uh, and about 30% of the shares are held by uh, board and uh, senior management. To give you an overview of the, of the company, it's a, it's a very resilient um, vet services um, portfolio and as I said before, we've got high growth opportunities. Um, the core veterinary business is providing veterinary services. So that's uh, consulting to production animal um, production animal uh, area, as well as um, providing veterinary services to the companion side in, uh, in our clinics. Um, so we also provide uh, animal wellbeing, and as I said, um, other services around um, biosecurity and food safety auditing. Uh, we, as I said before, we, we do cover the, the whole animal spectrum. We've got 46 veterinary clinics uh, located through the production animal areas. We've got a joint venture with uh, Petstock. We've got two clinics in, uh, in Petstock uh, pet stores. And, uh, and overall, we have about 150 veterinarians across, across the country. Those veterinary services are supported by technical products and, and products make up about 80% of our uh, revenue. Uh, we have our own inner house, uh, warehousing, logistics services, about 20 delivery vans that deliver in, directly into our clients, into um, those uh, rural areas. 
Uh, we've also got a number of uh, new products, as I said before, that are coming to market, which I'll, uh, I'll talk to in, in a minute. So on top of our core veterinary business, we also have a number of high growth complementary business initiatives that we can leverage across our client base. So these are in the area of uh, genetics. We operate two um, pig genetic uh, centres and two um, sheep genetic centres uh, where we're supplying semen out uh, into, the, uh, into the industry. We also have our own um, diagnostic lab and vaccine production facility, uh, which we acquired um, at the end of uh, 2019 which again uh, provides new products and, and new services that we can provide across our uh, animal footprint. In addition to Australia, we also provide veterinary consultancy services in 10 other countries. Um, we have a, a, a joint venture with a large uh, pig veterinary group in the US, uh, which we formed about 18 months ago, and uh, we've been distributing a number of uh, products into the, the pig industry uh, there. If we have a look at, uh, at where, where our clinics are, um, what's uh, very good about our business is it is diversified in terms of um, the species uh, that we service, uh, different geographies, uh, we're in different commodities and, and different markets. So it gives us a bit of diversity for when one of our segments might be down, usually uh, the other ones are going quite well. We operate the clinics uh, on a regional basis and you'll see that there's clusters um, and those clusters, we operate them as, uh, as regions. And so we may have between six and 10 veterinary clinics within a two or 300 kilometer region. And uh, vets and our staff will work um, across that region in different clinics based on what their skill sets are. And, and if those that have um, special interests or specialist skills, then they will work across a number of clinics in order to be more efficient and, and leverage the expertise that we have across the, uh, the larger business. We do make uh, acquisitions. We've made about two or three a year. We don't consider ourselves a, um, a collector of veterinary clinics. Um, we more like focus on those large clinics um, that can add value to us, either through um, expanding our um, regional exposure into a new area or providing uh, specialist expertise that can be leveraged across the whole company. Looking at uh, our financial performance, we've had resilient revenue growth over the last three years, um, despite the challenging industry conditions that you've seen in agricultural areas with uh, drought in the last couple of years, and prior to that, the uh, collapse of the dairy industry. So we've still been able to continue to generate uh, revenue growth year on year. Some of that has been contributed due to acquisitions, but we're also seeing uh, organic growth as well. Uh, what we have done in the last uh, couple of years, a targeted change towards our um, higher value products and services, and that is uh, dry, driving a strong gross margin improvement um, across the business. Uh, FY20 year to date up to March, uh, we reported a few weeks ago, that's performing uh, strongly, uh, particularly as those products and services that we've been developing are coming to market. And this has uh, occurred in, in the face of the COVID-19 challenges. So I'll just... Um, talk a little bit uh, just about our overall um, strategic focus so and I did mention it before so our, our first phase was really about building the foundation of, of the company and from 2015 right through to probably halfway through last year uh, we were um, building those foundations and putting integrated systems across the business so that all our, um, our operations now are integrated into a central uh, ERP, ERP. The second part of a business plan is to grow the number of animals that we service and we do this uh, predominantly organically, um, but we will do it through um, acquisitions or, or development of new clinics. And then the third component is about uh, leveraging those new services and products uh, across those uh, animal numbers. And we're doing that through um, bringing new products to market. We're developing some products of ourselves that we've just brought to market. And, uh, and new service programs. And I'll talk a little bit about those uh, now. So this financial year um, has seen a lot of these pro uh, new services and products uh, come to market. Uh, in, uh, in July, uh, we introduced our Best Mates program, which is a wellness program uh, for companion animals. In August, we introduced a similar program into the dairy industry. We acquired our uh, ACE laboratory services in October, which I said is a diagnostic lab for production animals as well as um, produces uh, custom vaccines, um, predominantly for pig and uh, poultry industry. We acquired uh, Devoted Vets in November, which is in Gippsland to expand our footprint in, in Gippsland. In November, we signed uh, a distribution agreement for um, 
uh, other ASX listed company, Zuno, their new uh, disinfectant nanotechnology. Um, December, we acquired Brand News Animal Health, which gave us uh, exposure to the uh, sheep consulting industry, as well as uh, other uh, specialist services in the sheep industry, particularly around parasitology uh, laboratories. And, uh, and here we are uh, last month in March, and we're continuing um, our business and continuing to roll out these programs and grow these programs um, despite the, the uh, COVID-19 challenges. So I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19. So for us, um, a, a viral pandemic is something that as a veterinary business, we deal with every day. So whether it's in, in the production animals and we, and we have um, uh, viral pandemics in, uh, in pig or in poultry industry, or whether it's in a companion animal um, clinic with um, the parvovirus outbreak, these are things that we deal with every day. And so um, in, introducing um, hygiene, um, systems and, and biosecurity systems and, and uh, having clear um, demarcation between clean and dirty lines, um, that, that's just part of our normal business. So we were able to implement um, a response very quickly um, when, uh, when this uh, uh, started to occur and we continue to do that now. So in companion animals, we were able to implement you know, strict clinic guidelines and protocols and we've been able to continue to, to operate those um, those companion animal clinics very strongly. In the agriculture and livestock industry, we had already um, in the previous 12 months been looking at uh, how we could do remote consulting and, uh, and leverage our expertise across a larger, a larger client group um, without the necessity to necessarily uh, travel to, um, to all those places. So um, introducing technologies like our, our headwear, our remote uh, camera system, uh, telemedicine, things like that, um, we've been able to actually launch them very quickly um, once uh, the COVID-19 restrictions came in. Our companion animal business has continued to trade strongly in, in March and April, um, and I think that's reflective of, um, of the success of the implemented response and what we've been able to do very quickly. Talk about uh, Zuno disinfectant um, distribution agreements. So, um, the Zuno, it's a New Zealand company that has a, um, a nanotechnology, new, new technology for disinfection. Um, we, we started doing trial work with, um, with the Zuno group about 12 months ago. And as a result of that 12 month, uh, that uh, research back in uh, end of last year, we um, signed an exclusive distribution agreement for the use of that product in livestock agriculture, uh, initially in Australia and then, uh, and then in the US. Um, what's unique about this product is it provides an ongoing mechanical activity um, well beyond um, the, the chemical activity that occurs on day one. And it's been tested by over 150 uh, independent tests um, by third party labs. So initially a product that was, has been used in, in the human side that we've now um, brought over to the, uh, the animal industries. Um, some of that trial work has shown effectiveness against um, many of the common bacteria and viruses that we have in, in animals. Uh, it's also been shown to be effective against COVID-19. In fact, it has uh, TGA approval in Australia for COVID-19 on hard surfaces. And it's also effective against uh, influenza and African swine fever, which are two of the um, diseases that are, that are going through the pig and poultry uh, industry globally at the moment. Um, certainly, um, there's been a, a surge in demand um, since, we, since we launched the product um, officially in March this year. So there's been strong in interest from the pig, poultry and the, uh, and the veterinary industries. Um, and that's resulted in a material contribution from the launch of the product sales, which only happened in the, the last couple of weeks of March. Uh, we had successful trials in, our U in the US pig industry. And um, it was effective uh, to prevent uh, disease against porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which is a, a, a pig coronavirus that causes um, scours or, or enteric disease in, in pigs at very high mortality uh, rates and uh, spreads very, uh, very readily uh, in the environment. So um, very similar to what uh, uh, we're seeing in terms of the spread of, um, of the COVID-19. So we've been very successful in, in being able to prevent that, uh, prevent that disease uh, spreading in the farms that we put it into the US. We've also entered uh, uh, into, uh, we're in the process of in entering into agreements, sorry, with distribution partners in, the Phil in Philippines and Vietnam. 
Um, and we're on track for the first quarter of uh, FY21 to bring those products into that market. And what excites us there is that both those countries have uh, significant issues with um, African swine fever. We have seen some new customers and applications since COVID-19. And um, in terms of uh, using this product in veterinary clinics offices, um, we did a racetrack the other day. We've got it being used in uh, pet food plants in the US in feed mills um, to prevent uh, infection in vehicles and, uh, and also in pet stores. So we think this is a, a, a certainly a, a significant product for us going into the future. We've also uh, launched in the last um, nine months uh, Pro Dairy, which is a consultancy uh, program for the dairy industry. Uh, it's an innovative subscription model um, where we are putting in preventative programs, uh, animal health programs, doing staff training, um, implementing uh, risk management programs, as well as analysing the data um, out of those um, farms to uh, improve their productivity. And as part of that, they can also use our online ordering system to uh, improve the supply of, um, of products. We, uh, we actually um, undertook a full marketing campaign um, in conjunction with the start of the AFL um, um, season this year. And in other words, basically at the start of the COVID-19 um, impact on Australia. And, um, and that has seen some growth in, uh, in um, this program. We have um, approximately 10% of, uh, of Victoria's uh, dairy cows have been subscribed by, uh, are under subscription um, by their owners to the program. So this is a real uh, strategy to increase our market penetration um, in APM's other geographic areas for the dairy industry. If we look at our Best Mates program, like this is a wellness program um, to drive recurring growth in animal services. Uh, this was a launched in July 2019 um, in, a, in a couple of clinics and then it's been expanded across our, our company um, over the last nine months. We've seen average member growth of just under 18% per month since the launch um, and we've seen continued growth during March and April despite COVID-19 where we're continuing to sign up about 300 uh, new members every month. So members pay an annual subscription charge, it's about $525 for the first uh, first pet and then second pet is uh, slightly less than that. So if we look at, uh, at APM overall, we, we've been um, delivering growth in our core business and certainly as agricultural in, uh, conditions have improved, um, and you can see from the rainfall graph there that since December, um, there's been um, continue, continuation of, of rain across most of the country and this is certainly um, improving um, the, uh, those industries. So the recent rainfall and, and improved commodity prices, particularly in the dairy industry, um, they're, they're looking positive for a second half to FY20. There's obviously a global shortage of meat protein on the back of African swine fever through uh, China and Asia and parts of uh, Eastern Europe. And that's gonna support growth in animal numbers across all the, the meat protein species. Our new business lines are delivering strong financial contributions. Um, particularly as improved animal biosecurity practices and, and COVID-19 business practices have uh, increased. We made some acquisitions towards the end of, uh, of last calendar year and those are, are performing um, extremely well and, and in line with expectations. Uh, we reported a couple of weeks ago um, a strong Q3 um, performance where our Q3 on a like-for-like -like basis with the, the previous year was 16.2% up at a revenue level and um, but nearly 30 percent up at a gross profit uh, level so apm is expecting to deliver uh, ebit growth um, into the second half of uh, fy20 compared to the first half our second half tends to be a bit stronger because of the activities that occur and um, we our board announced a, a dividend on the uh, first half of fy20 and, and that was paid um, last week so in terms of investing in, in APM, um, we are a robust and diversified business model and we underpin growth um, despite the various market cycles that we see in, uh, in agriculture, veterinary services um, continue to be uh, used to make sure that we maintain the welfare and the health of the animals and, and improve productivity in, um, in um, production animals um, despite what's happening across market cycles. Uh, we've got high growth and complementary business initiatives which we've introduced into the area of consulting with with uh, 
pro um, dairy and with uh, best mates. Uh, we've got our diagnostics and, and new innovative product technologies that have come to market in the last few months. We generate uh, strong cash and, um, and that at the moment is enabling our, our growth strategy and, and maintenance of our dividends. Got a highly experienced uh, board and management team and um, there's certainly favourable long-term industry outlooks for Australian agriculture, um, as well as the companion animal business in the rural and regional areas. So with that, I'll um, happy to open it up to any questions. Um, Chris, thank you very much for that. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. So I'm just going to start at the at the top. Um, like the the first question was, um, what growth do you see in I guess herd numbers in sheep and cattle in the in the market you are exposed to now that we seem to be at the end of this terrible drought? Yes, yeah, so certainly most of our um, beef uh, beef uh, work is uh, has been in beef feedlots. So during the drought, the um, certainly beef feedlots continued to expand. Um, but having said that, there's still a extremely high demand for high quality beef, and so we're still still seeing um, those feedlots hold uh, hold numbers to date, um, sending beef into into export markets. So. I think in terms of the, the, the beef feedlots, uh, that's really, you know, it is an industry that goes up and down, um, but certainly it, um, in the larger operators, which we service, they've certainly got strong markets um, in, in the high quality beef. So we expect that will um, you know, continue to expand over, over, over time. Uh, in terms of pasture-based beef, yeah, certainly there's a lot of restocking happening. Uh, we haven't had too much exposure to that area, but certainly since we've um, acquired uh, Livestock Logic at Hamilton, they they do some beef consulting, and so that has enabled us to do um, a lot more um, work into the beef industry, particularly in the western district of, uh, of Victoria, um, as well as in northern northern Tasmania, which um, and, and both those areas are going extremely well in terms of um, uh, rainfall and um, productivity this year. So yeah, we, we don't really have too much exposure. Well, we don't have really any exposure to Northern Queensland uh, beef industry. It's mainly in the high rainfall areas in um, Victoria, Tasmania, and uh, and some through um, Western or South, Central West uh, New South Wales. And then um, just a, a question on the, the ACE Lab Services acquisition, just if you can expand on the rationale for that. Yeah, so Ace, Ace Labs is um, there's a couple of reasons why we acquired that. So, so one is it um, it it has a diagnostic laboratory, and and as um, as we're going to reduce uh, the use of antibiotics in the production animals, we're moving more towards having doing more diagnostics on farm, so that we so that we can really determine when those uh, where those diseases are likely to occur, and then we can limit the, the time that we are using antibiotics. Um, secondly, we're, we're seeing a real move towards alternative to antibiotics as well as um, new vaccine production. And um, so having that diagnostic services enable us, enables us to, to better target our vaccines um, to ensure that, uh, that they're working and, uh, and we're getting the best out of them. The second part of that business is an autogenous vaccine um, facility. And um, if we look at uh, vaccine use in Australia, most of, the, most of the products that we use are manufactured um, in the US or in Europe, and there are two um, strains of the um, pathogens, which are usually, uh, or in many cases, European or US strains. So we don't necessarily see those those vaccines be uh, as highly efficacious in Australia as what they see in other countries. What ACE uh, has the ability to do is it, it, is, a, it is a permit vaccine. So we can take the specific um, pathogen from a farm and make a vaccine at that facility specifically for that uh, for that farm. So it's really a, it's a custom vaccine facility plant, and um, and it's mainly supplying custom vaccines um, to the pig and poultry industry where uh, existing commercial vaccines either are, either don't work or um, we don't have vaccines available for those uh, diseases. Okay, thanks. Chris, questions are coming in thick and fast. Let me know if you have to go now at 10 because we're only scheduled to 10, but I, I'll go through the questions as they come. Um, the next couple are around debt. So one is um, debt levels you're comfortable with in the business. Um, you know, where debt is now, does that constrain your ability to make further acquisitions? Um, and, you know, the, the business's ability to cut to... Um, carry this debt load and issues around debt covenants? 
Yeah, great. So you will see that um, at the at, um, at 31st of December, our our borrowings had increased to 38.4 million, and that and that was mainly because of the uh, cash component that we paid out on the three acquisitions. We also took a strategic uh, increase in inventory. So we uh, we sort of predicted that, um, that 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 China was going to have a few issues around production. So we actually increased um, our inventory of all the products that we import from China. So that sort of has driven up our, um, our inventory, but we expect that to um, to come back um, as those products play out into into our uh, into our customers. Um, if you look at our operating operating leverage, then um, it, we have a, a gross debt to EBITDA um, at, at the thirty first of December of about three, and we have a, versus a covenant of um, of four. So we do have a bit of headroom there. We actually have about 16 million headroom that remains available under our acquisition facility. So we've still got the ability to make a number of acquisitions, um, uh, certainly, um, yeah, of smaller smaller type acquisitions um, within Australia. So 16 million headroom, um, you know, it's probably around, um, because we do issue some script um, when we do acquisitions. So it's about 24 million um, dollars in, in value there. So if you sort of look at those acquisitions, we can probably um, probably do another three to four million in EBITDA and acquisitions um, before um, it pushes our um, pushes towards our covenant. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, what we where we'd like to be is um, is closer to two, um, but and we think that um, with what we're seeing in the business at the moment, um, generation of cash, um, that that will be continually moving back towards that level. Okay, thanks, Chris. And then another one: um, Who's your main competitor in the sector? Obviously, you're you're spanning quite a lot of businesses. But is there another group that kind of you compete with, or is it uh, horses for courses? You know, different groups in different sectors of your business. Yeah, certainly. Uh, uh, the majority of our competitors are, are just private vet, uh, veterinary clinics. So um, usually. Small veterinary clinics. There's a couple of larger ones that may have, um, you know, that have sort of um, around 10, 10 to 15 veterinarians. But, but uh, yeah, our major competitors are, are um, yeah, private veterinary um, clinics. Okay, and then I think you might have addressed this uh, in the presentation, but. Um page four you know, a question on quite a few of the businesses in their strategy to have a common APM branding um, noticing you have a centralized ERP um, I, I think you said you have got a centralized ERP working now with the, are new acquisitions falling into that I think is the question yeah that's correct so yeah so we have a centralized ERP um, in our in our um, mixed animal practices, they operate under a practice management system called RX Works, and uh, and that, that integrates back into our um, ERP. So yeah, basically now um, we're pretty well set up, and any further acquisitions we do, um, they've been integrating very quickly into our systems. Okay, and then what is the size of the addressable markets for the for the zona services in the countries you have rights to? done any modeling on that um that's a that's a pretty interesting question that's the one that everyone wants to know um i think if you, if you sort of look at um yeah wh where do we think that would be i, th I think in australia the, the the market the total market on those products in pig and poultry industry assuming that they um, that that product um um, gives the similar um performance benefits that we've seen in trials in new zealand is probably around that ten million dollars is, is a market opportunity. Um, the opportunity in the U.S. market is, you know, those markets are around 30, 30 times bigger than um, than the Australian uh, Australian market. So, you know, it it really comes back to um, the specific, you know, how this how this product performs and the specific needs in each of those markets. But certainly. Um, yeah, there's there's some real opportunities there, but um, we also need to uh, to execute on you know in those markets. Okay, and then just uh, on acquisition strategy, Chris, um, how are the deals structured? You know, EBITDA or EBIT multiple plus our notes. You know, are our notes used to retain, I guess, key staff within the businesses that you're acquiring? Yep. So we, we tend to do acquisitions um, around that five uh, five to six times uh, EBITDA. We do them as um, seventy percent uh, cash and thirty percent script. 
and the and then um, the key key people within those businesses, the ex owners, um, also, um, who uh, who get that script. Fifty percent is escrowed for one year and fifty percent for two years. Um, in addition, uh, those key people are also contracted in between um, two and five years. Okay, great. We we don't uh, we it, it, we've had a couple of cases where um, we have had um, have had earnouts, um, but. Um, predominantly we, we tend to um, agree on a price um, on the basis that they are, they're taking a fair percentage of it in script. Okay. And then is the pro dairy business adaptable to uh, organic dairy farming? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, they, they can quite readily um, go across into organic uh, dairy farming. Yeah. Okay. And then is there a strategy for a common APM branding right across all of the businesses? Or are you going to stick with um, brands that have strong local um, acceptance, I guess, in various regions? Yeah, so to date, so to date uh, in those uh, rural clinics, we've maintained their existing brands because those brands have been extremely strong in those local regions. Some of them are second generation veterinary clinics. Um, however, I'm saying that our programs that we put across um, all those clinics are, are all AP, APM branded or APM uh, co-branded. We have we do have some parts of the business that have already um, cons uh, consolidated their um, existing businesses into an APM brand. So, for example, the um, our genetic centres in the sheep industry that were trading under um, Macquarie Artificial Breeders and, and all stock, they now come under APM Genetic Services. And our um, our two uh, pig and poultry businesses are currently coming under APM Pig and Poultry. So we are seeing a, a transition across some of our um, business segments at the moment. Um, but uh, currently, in the uh, existing dairy and mixed animal clinics, they continue to um, the pro the prominent brand is their is their local brand. But um, certainly, the APM brand is starting to get uh, more exposure. Okay, great. Um... Chris, we're just on ten o'clock, so I think we're going to we're going to leave it there. Thank you for fielding all of those questions. And um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, uh, if they've got any follow ups, um, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, so just um, just uh, contact me via my email, which is just chris at apm.com.au. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, that concludes the third of the coffee microcaps morning meeting series we'll be doing another one in two weeks time on may 21st same time 9 a.m to 10 a.m same place will be a live webinar chris thank you very much and yeah i'll let everybody go because i am where the opening match is about to start <laughs>